And I, just to, for me to get a sense of the audience a little bit, um, uh, can people raise their hands if you're a, 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 a health professional, a health care provider, or a student going into? So maybe about a third of the class. Anyone in the mental health field here? Okay, so I'll try to provide a little bit of a tips, some clinical tips, but knowing that that may not be the main focus of what the audience is here to learn about. And this is going to be kind of a broad overview of um, I guess how to think about culture and mental health. And one of the things I'd like to say also is that the cultural culture in psychiatry, not only do we, um, it's important for us to understand, we have to also be open-minded to the fact that sometimes when we study, study other people's cultures, that really opens up our minds to our own culture, okay? Um, so this is the kind of, a little bit of the outline of the talk. I don't have any disclosures, um, and I, ha I like this quote, is, I don't know who discovered water, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't a fish. <laughs> so, and the idea is like, we live in the water, and our water is the, the culture that we live in now. And sometimes it's hard for us to see it until we kind of jump out of the, out of the water. So this is, uh, the main question is, uh, that I've taken as the, the topic of uh, this talk is, what are the way, in what ways does culture influence mental health? Okay, so this is meant to be a broad uh, overview because these things can, uh, this could be a really long, long talk, but I'm going to try to keep it within the time allotted. And uh, the kind of corollary questions are, why understand culture, and what is the clinical relevance? So hopefully I will start, to an start I think, to answer some of these questions. Now, uh, how many of you are familiar with the DSM? That's the Manual for Psychiatrists. It describes all the mental disorders. And in the DSM, in one of the appendices, it has this thing called a cultural formulation. And it's recommended that psychiatrists or mental health professionals using the DSM think about a cultural formulation with their patients. And it doesn't even need to be patients who are of a different culture than yourself, but just to think about uh, cultural formulation. And the pieces of the cultural formulation is, are, is the cultural identity, thinking about, so if you're working with someone or their family, Think about what is cultural identity, uh, explanatory models of illness. How do people understand their illness? Cultural stressors and supports. What are the cultural things that can help or exacerbate illness? And then what are some of the cultural elements of the relationship with the clinician, with the doctor? So are there some cultural issues that you need to be aware of as a doctor? And the idea is that the, when you do a cultural formulation, it forces you to be kind of systematic in thinking through some of the cultural issues when working with people. Um, and so it can seem kind of daunting and long, but really uh, you kind of have to pick and choose the pieces you're going to do, but it's super useful to have all the elements in your mind that you know you can go to when you're thinking about these mental health issues. And I've taken this, uh, the cultural formulation as kind of the outline for the presentation today. So I'm going to take this basically into four parts. So that's kind of our roadmap for this evening. So let's start with a uh, cultural, what cultural identity? What is cultural identity and how do we think about cultural identity? Um, oh, and I have this little slide to show you that one of the first things that people think about when they think about cultural identity and culture, is this an individualistic kind of society or culture or is this a collectivist or family, sometimes family oriented? So it's egocentric versus sociocentric and Based on this, that actually influences so how people see themselves in relationship to other people actually does influence a couple of other very important items, such as how do people deal with authority? So hierarchical versus egalitarian cultures. Communication style. When you have this kind of orientation, what, what, how does that affect communication style? And then in turn, how does communication style affect emotional expressivity? expressivity? And you can then also see what is the relationship to others and to nature sometimes with bound up within this individualistic versus collectivistic perspective? And then how do people explain illnesses? And how do people even just think about themselves? So this would be another way to organize this presentation, by the way. But I've decided to keep it to basic a more linear kind of a process. So when we talk about identity, and when I, I, I those, those in the roadmap, I talked about the different uh, kind of the four subsections. Uh, in each subsection, I have a couple of sub-subsections. So under identity, I have the question, what aspects of identity are related to culture? And so one of the things I just mentioned was the individual versus collective perspective. 
acculturation, what is that? How does that relate to identity? Communication style, emotional expressivity, and language proficiency. I am going to skip the piece on language proficiency just because that's, in fact, some of the core issues around uh, culture and psychiatry depends on language proficiency with the patient if you're working with patients. But I, uh, there's a lot written about working with interpreters and translators, so I'm, I'm just going to asterisk this and bracket it for now, just saying that this is super important as you might imagine. But let me start with the individual versus the collective perspective. Um, and uh, I'll just, I'm going to go back to this in, in later in the talk. So I'm just to mention one key element in Asian families, or traditional Asian families, I'll say, is oftentimes the key unit of decision or function is not the individual, but the family. And uh, the clinical example would be confidentiality. So I remember when I was in Taiwan as a fourth year medical student, I was on the psychiatric unit there. And uh, it was humongous, so there would be like 40 or 50 patients there. And the chief resident would come out and would say, okay, we're going to have a group discussion here. And the first question that everyone always asked was, how do I get to leave the hospital? And the chief resident had the same answer every week after week, would always say, okay, there are three parties involved in your care. There's yourself, there's your family, and there's your doctor. So if two, to the, two out of the three think you can leave, then you can leave. So just to go show you how important the family, like that doesn't happen in the United States, although in a de facto way, sometimes it does happen in that way because if the family can't take the person home, for example, then the doctor is not is much less likely to uh, take the person home, especially if they don't think it, that's correct. But that's one example. So the unit of, um, of confidentiality may not necessarily be the patient, the individual, but the unit of confidentiality is the family. Um, how many of you saw The Farewell? recently, so, right? So in that movie, and I hope I'm not giving it away, but the, the, fam, the, the identified patient isn't told about the diagnosis, but the family knows, and the, the limits of confidentiality are expected by the family, probably to the physicians, that it stays within the family. So you can tell other family members, but you can't tell people outside the family as physicians. Now, we in the West, if you're working with me, by the way, uh, I have to go by American, U.S. legal laws and customs, and I, it's a fine line to straddle, but most of the time I'm going to be saying, hey, this is confidential between me and the patient, unless the person gives me explicit uh, permission. Acculturation. Uh, I think you're all familiar with this term, right? It means um, how uh, the degree to which an individual conforms to majority cultural values and norms. So that's what it means to be acculturated. Now, one thing I just want to highlight about acculturation that's very important is when you're assessing someone's cultural identity, not only are you assessing their, their, their perspective on individual versus family, for example, you might also under, try to understand how acculturated they are. Now, acculturation doesn't occur like broadly, necessarily. People may be very acculturated in one area of their life, but not acculturated in another. So for example, they may be acculturated with respect to um, uh, interpersonal interactions in terms of language and so forth, but for, exa uh, but, uh, for example, marital or sexual behavior may be still very traditional. So you have to think about uh, acculturation not just being uh, broadly, if, one pers if a person's acculturated in one area, that means they're acculturated everywhere, but it varies. And one advantage of thinking about the level of acculturation is it helps reduce stereotyping, because then we know individuals may come from traditional backgrounds, but from that traditional background, they may have differences. Um, okay, communication style. Now, communication style is um, super important. Um, the, in more individualistic societies, or I'll say more collectivist societies, indirect communication may be more highly prized, for example. So in our culture, it turns out that we really have the, prime, the, the spoken word or the written word is really primary, that we highlight that a lot. Um, but in other cultures, uh, they, they, they may say it doesn't really matter what they say, but how they say it. And so, so therefore, we prize directness and honesty and being kind of straightforward. Other people may uh, prize indirectness a little more. So, so for those of you clinicians in the room, so one of the things just to be aware of is when you're, whenever you do consent forms and stuff like that, that may be a very foreign concept, not only to... Uh, um, Chinese patients, but other Asian patients, particularly if they come from places where they haven't seen many doctors beforehand. So it's very important to explain what the purposes of the, of the consent form is. And a lot of times I have to just be really explicit with them. This does not mean that I'm giving up my responsibility for your treatment. That doesn't mean, because patients may believe that, okay, when they sign this, that means I can do whatever I want to them. That, that's not the case. 
Um, and uh, now, nonverbal communication has actually been the study of a lot of people. Um, and each one of these topics I'm going to mention are like long PhD theses, for example. So the topics would be things like kinesics, proxemics, or paralanguage. These are just pieces of nonverbal communication that have been studied. So if you break it down and really think about it, it can be very helpful. Um, so kinesics or hapnics, kinesics is the study of bodily movements and how, like, how much are you supposed to move your body, for example. So it, typically in many Asian cultures, you don't move your body that much. You certainly don't touch people unless uh, in special circumstances. Now, they may understand that physicians are supposed to touch them, um, particularly more acculturated uh, patients. But patients who come from traditional backgrounds or from lower socioeconomic may not know anything more than the doctor is supposed to take their pulse and maybe look at their tongue. That, that might be it. So um, uh, kinesics is the study of uh, bodily movements, and hapnics is the study of whether you, of touching. Um, another thing about uh, kinesics that might kind of fall under this would be uh, eye contact, right? So in many uh, Asian cultures, direct eye contact is thought to be kind of confrontational and impolite. So it may be that um, people are not making eye contact, particularly with authority figures. So as physicians, we have to be aware that just because a person doesn't make eye contact with it doesn't mean that they're necessarily guarded or suspicious, which, typical, which may be typical things that we're thinking about as psychiatrists. But we have to really investigate that to see is that kind of uh, part of a, that's just the culture. And so we can't assume that they have other kinds of issues going on. Um, Proxemics is the study of interpersonal distances. Again, uh, Asian people, uh, traditional Asian people may stand further back. They, they, there isn't like handshake, it's more like you stand further back, you bow. Um, I think that's, that's all I'd want to say about that for now, but just to get a sense of, oh, and I guess from a psychiatric point of view, if people get into your space, is that being intrusive? Does that indicate some psychopathology or is that just part of, you know, and that, that, space, that feeling of being intruded upon may vary depending on who you're working with. Uh, and in other cultures, being very close and touching people is very normal and is thought to be is normative. But in Asian cultures in general, uh, I would say generally not. Uh, paralanguage is all the things in language except the words. So if you take the, you know, the ums, the inflections, that's all considered para, uh, paralanguage. I like to put this picture of Barack Obama because he I thought he was a master of paralanguage. The way he spoke, inflections, and even if you didn't understand the words whatsoever, the way he spoke, you can get a feeling of the emotion he was trying to convey. It was very uh, um, masterful in some ways. Uh, in European and uh, Asian cultures tend to have lower tones, not so much emotional tone in when, when they talk. Um, <coughs> So that, that would be, uh, the uh, paralanguage might also include space or silence in language. So how much, li how much silence are you willing to tolerate in a conversation? Um, typically in the doctor-patient relationship in Asian cultures, again traditionally, there may be more sense that the patient should be silent and wait for your prompting to respond to them. So you, uh, if the person is silent, doesn't necessarily mean they're being shifty or again or, or, or guarded. That's just maybe them showing respect for you. Um, yeah, so that that's kind of what, one of the things I, these are the, the things I wanted to mention in terms of communication style. Again, there's a lot more to it, and uh, I think a couple slides ago I had some um, uh, YouTube links. So if you want to go back to the slides, you can go to the YouTube links, and there's, and again, like I said, there's PhD theses written about this. Emotional expressivity. Uh, different cultures really vary in terms of how acceptable it is to express emotion and what, emotion, what emo facial expressions actually mean. So uh, Paul Ekman, who's one of the uh, most famous psychologists who was here at UCSF, did a lot of studies of facial expression and showed some universal facial expressions across all cultures. Turns out that the rate at which you use uh, facial expressions, when is appropriate to use facial expressions, really varies a lot. So typically, Asian cultures, Confucian cultures tend to, uh, the ability to modulate your emotion is kind of a sign of a maturity, in fact, not someone who's emotionally repressed or stunted. But we would consider that, or Asians would consider that, that's a more mature person. That person can control their emotions. That's more highly prized. And being more subtle, for example. Um, Smiling is another example of facial expression. Now, uh, I, I learned early on that, for example, if, a, if an Asian uh, patient tells me that they 
you know, didn't take their medications and smiled doesn't mean that they were being rebellious or anything like that. They were embarrassed. Smiling can mean embarrassment in certain cultures. So just being aware of these things can really help a lot, I think, and avoid misinterpretation, particularly in psychiatry when we're looking at these kinds of things as part of our mental status examination and trying to get these ideas about where the person is at this point. Okay, so I think we pretty much hit identity. We talked about uh, the individual versus collective orientation in the individual identity, uh, in a, a cultural identity, uh, the level of acculturation being really important, communication style with kinesics, haptics, um, proxemics, and emotional expressivity, and plus a bunch of others as being areas of study and important to just be aware of when you're working with people of different cultures. And then level of emotional expressivity. So actually, in, in I've heard the kind of the, the, the stereotype, and again, this is a stereotype in which people really vary, but just to be open-minded about, you know, European and Asians tend to be more emotion, less emotionally expressive. Latino and African-American culture tends to be more emotionally expressive. So when you're looking at people uh, and trying to s suss them out, you, you, it's important to start to think about these things in the background. Now I'm going to talk about explanatory models of illness. So it's like, how do people understand illness, and how do they think about it? Um, I think this is a really interesting uh, issue because it actually also brings up a lot of kind of philosophical issues within the field of psychiatry about mental illness. Um, a super interesting study, a, a famous study, was done by a, a psychiatrist named Arthur Kleinman. And in 1980, he went to Hunan, China, and he studied uh, 100 consecutive patients who had been diagnosed by Chinese psychiatrists with neurasthenia. How many of you are familiar with neurasthenia? You're nodding there, but most people have not heard of neurasthenia, which is good, because then I can teach you something here. <laughs> so, um, so what is neurasthenia? Uh, now, OK, in the United States, we have the, IC, we have the DSM-5. That's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, fifth edition that helps psychiatrists diagnose and forms our dictionary of, like, what's the definition of depression or schizophrenia, for example. In the rest of the world, they actually use the ICD-9, International Classification of Diseases, and they're up to the 10th edition, or I think they're up to the 11th edition, but in the 10th edition, I think it's still the same in the 11th edition, they describe what is neurasthenia. So we don't even have this diagnosis, but it is in the ICD-10, and it is described as, I'll just read this for you, either persistent and distressing complaints of increased fatigue after mental effort or persistent and distressing complaints of bodily weakness and exhaustion after minimal effort. And the interesting part is after effort. I think I would highlight that part. Because I remember when I was in China, uh, I think this was, uh, gosh, I think it was 88 when I was, uh, 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 right after I graduated from college, I was taking some classes there. My cousin was saying he had neurasthenia. In, in Mandarin, it's in Jing Sui Ro. And it just kind of means like your nerves are just kind of broken up. Uh, and he was saying, I have neurasthenia. I was like, what does that mean? He's like, well, I've been studying for three nights in a row. I've been studying really hard for three days in a row, and I'm just exhausted. My brain is tired. So there's this concept that like, if you use your brain a lot, it gets tired, which makes complete sense to me. I'm surprised we don't have anything like this in the, in the DSM. In the, in the West, we kind of think, well, the brain's more like a computer. It's either on or it's off, and it doesn't matter whether you use it or not. It's just you might as well use it all the time. But in uh, Asian cultures, neurasthenia is a very common diet diagnosis, probably one of the most common diagnoses. And then, oh, and that also has to, not only do you have this persistent fatigue after mental effort or weakness and exhaustion after minimal effort, you have to have at least two of the following. Feelings of muscular aches and pains, dizziness, tension headaches, sleep disturbance, inability to relax, irritability, or dyspepsia. And not, and it can't be something, it can't be described better, described by something else. So that's, that's neurasthenia. That's the definition of neurasthenia. Does, does it sound, for those of you in the healthcare field, does it sound like anyone you might know or see? It's not, like these are relatively nonspecific symptoms, but very common. And you will hear them like, and you, you, you actually, I'll go through this in a minute. So anyways, let me go back. So okay, 1980, Arthur Kleinman goes to China. All these people have neurasthenia. What the heck is neurasthenia? We don't even have neurasthenia. We have the DSM-5. We only have anxiety and depression. So he goes, he meets 100, he meets 100 patients with diagnosed with uh, neurasthenia. And he says, OK, of these I diagnosed, I used the DSM. 93 of them had depression, and 71 had anxiety disorders. Now, he said, so, so the idea was like, so now the question comes up, so are, are these Chinese psychiatrists, are they just misdiagnosing all these patients with depression with neurasthenia, right? Um, and so the idea, and this is what Arthur Kleinman thought, okay, so this is the way you can look at it. You can look at it as a cultural relativist perspective. So you have this underlying illness, whatever it is, 
He thought, one way to look at this, you have culture A that gives you manifestation A, or you have culture B and you get cult manifestation B. Okay, so the example in this situation, so let's say underlying all this, people have some illness. If they live in China, they get neurasthenia, and if they live in the West, America or whatever, they get depression. Is that one, that's one way of looking at it. And people have thought about this, and another example would be in the West, we have this idea of like, some people have this thing called hysteria. This is like an old concept. But if, you live, if you're a male and you live in the United States, you might develop what we call antisocial personality disorder. If you're female and you live in this culture, you develop somatization disorder. And I put a couple of stories here, uh, a couple of articles here about the relationship between histrionic personality or somatization disorder and antisocial personality. So that's just one way of looking at it. That's what we would call the social relativist perspective. And that's pretty consistent with you know, a biomedical perspective. Um, but then Arthur Kleinman was, you know, he, he is also an anthropologist by training. So he thought the, the, the question that you could come up now with in a thought experiment is, could a Chinese uh, psychiatrist come up and say to Don, hey, you know, all those patients you diagnosed with depression, you're all wrong. They're, they actually have neurasthenia. Would, how would Don be able to say, no, no, they really have depression and, and disprove what, the, what the, the, the Chinese psychiatrist had to say? So the question is, are American psychiatrists misdiagnosing U.S. patients? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get back to this in a minute. So now when we talk about, I've set the stage for, okay, now we're talking about explanatory models of illness. We have one explanation, depression. We have another explanation, neurasthenia. How do we understand these and how do we get these to come together in some way, okay? Um, so in this section of explanatory models, and this is a very interesting piece, part to me, uh, we're going to talk about idioms of distress and somatization. We're going to talk about cultural syndromes. We'll talk about what it means to be mentally healthy, in fact, because that actually, it turns out, is kind of culturally determined, believe it or not. And then uh, that will emphasize the importance of the patient's perspective. And I'll just make a little bullet point saying that's important. How many of you have heard of somatization? Has anyone heard of this concept of somatization? Okay. Now, usually, if you look it up on the internet, the, the definition is the production of recurrent and multiple medical symptoms with no discernible organic cause. Okay, now that's not a good definition, that's a bad definition, okay? Because that actually discerns, that means there's a separation. There's an organic cause, which means the body or physical, and the person has this mental uh, symptoms, but they really have mental symptoms, and they're just kind of faking it and saying they have bodily symptoms. Arthur Kleinman said, no. Somatization, that's not a good definition of somatization. This definition for soma, the better definition of somatization is the tendency to experience psychological distress in the form of somatic symptoms and to seek medical help for these symptoms. So that's, another, that's slightly better. Um, Arthur Kleinman actually said, I should say, uh, somatization is, the, it is people's idioms of distress in the language of the body. Okay, so using the body as a way of expressing individual distress. So we tend to think of it as either the somatizing, and we, I have, we tend to have a pejorative view of patients who somatize. I would say, in general, we would say yes, because that means they're concrete, they don't think psychologically. But really, if we think about somatization as the tendency to express individual distress in the idiom of the body, that might be another way of saying it. So, and if you look at it from a global perspective, it's not that people who somatize or express distress in the idiom of the body are abnormal in some way. From a global perspective, it is the West that's actually abnormal in the sense that we have this thing that we call psychologization. And it's the expression of personal and social distress in the idiom of emotions and internally realized affect. And in fact, this is kind of specific to Western culture. And uh, people have proposed that this is one of the West's major contributions to world culture, actually, is this concept of we have an internal uh, psychology and we have internally realized uh, emotions and affect. So when you ask the question, is neurasthenia simply undiagnosed depression, that is what is called a category fallacy. So this is these complicated terms in anthropology. But that kind of a question is like, you can't actually apply one culture's concept to another culture. So you have to think in a lot of these diagnoses are embedded in the culture, and they cannot be separated from the culture. That's not true for all of not the only way to look at depression or neurasthenia, but it's one important way to look at it. And we run into trouble if we begin to just think of it only in one way. 
an example of another category fallacy would be like, suppose I ask you, how many iron filings does a unicorn attract? That's a classic uh, qu uh, category fallacy question. Like, it doesn't make sense, the question. So if I say, oh, this person really has, uh, this person that was diagnosed with neurasthenia really has depression, it doesn't quite make sense. You're applying a different, cat the wrong category of things to the other thing. Uh, I like this. Uh, quote from Ursula K. Le Guin. She says, there's no right answers to wrong questions. Okay. So now we have this concept of medicalization. We have, psycho we have somatization, we have psychologization, we have medicalization. What is medicalization? That's the conceptualization of a social problem as a medical one. Okay. And I'm just going to, uh, since we don't, I'm kind of making sure we run on time here. I'm not going to have a long discussion about this. But it's basically thinking about something as a medical problem that allows, for example, to destigmatize. That one of the advantages of medicalizing a problem is allows us to destigmatize the issue. So we have um, alcoholism used to be considered a social problem. Now we consider addiction as a medical problem. We medicalize it. People can now say, oh, I have a problem with alcohol without fear of stigma or less fear of stigma. And um, uh, it, it brings to bear uh, society's resources in a non-stigmatizing way. So there are advantages to medicalization of problems. So uh, I think we're going to start having like, gun control is kind of partly a medicalization of things, because we know that's a risk factor for certain kinds of, for death, in fact. Uh, so. Uh, that's medical. Now, the, there are some downsides of medicalizations, for example, because you can't use some of the tools, medical tools, for some of these problems, really. So, I mean, uh, things like uh, uh, um, public education, changing our culture, changing our values, has to do with kind of more anthropological and social interventions, not amenable to a medical medicalization only. Okay. So let me go back to Kleiman and his 100, 100 neurasthenia patients. He, three years later, in 1983, he went back to China. So he evaluated 100 patients, and he actually told them, okay, I think you have depression or you have anxiety. And he actually did like med, he did some medications or psychotherapy with them. He spoke Mandarin, he speaks Mandarin fluently. He's still alive, by the way. And um, uh, uh, he, he went back, and of the 100 patients, 48 of them said, yeah, I, I think I probably have this, I have a depression, I have a depressive disorder or an anxiety disorder. And it became more of a medical thing. If yeah, it's a medical thing, 33% of them decreased their medical utilization. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, 48 of them continued with the kind of a medical, I have neurasthenia. 52 of them said, well, I have this psychological problem, it turns out. I met the psychiatrist. He said, I have these conflicts that I'm having. I'm having these problems at home. That's what's causing my problems. And in, in his book, if you read his book, um, he really does some case studies of people who lived through the Cultural Revolution, had some terrible things happen to them, had really had daily struggles. And with this new kind of psychological understanding, 70% of them actually decreased the amount of time they went to go see doctors. Because they realize, you know, it's not going to help me to go see a doctor if I have these family struggles at home. It's not going to help me to go see a doctor if I'm really struggling with understanding what happened to me in the past, for example. So it's kind of interesting that there was a benefit for a new psychological understanding, and that gets back to the issue of psychologization. So just another way to think about it, we have distress. You can express as bodily symptoms. If you do that, then you're more likely to get medical, you go to see doctors, get medical help seeking. If you have distress and you conceptualize as psychological symptoms, then you're more likely maybe to get psychiatric assistance and problem solving. That would be the proposition that one would have about the advantages of this new kind of idea of psychologization. Not that it's that new to us in the audience. So that brings us to cultural syndromes. How many of you heard of cultural syndromes or culture-bound syndromes? How many of you have you heard of these things? Don? Cultural syndromes. Cultural syndromes are disorders that occur only within certain cultures or subcultures and are supported by cultural beliefs. And we believe the main genesis is because of cultural beliefs. And they're recognized as disorders by, other, by individuals within the culture, but are often unrecognizable to people from other cultures. So just like if we went to China and I've, you know, now I know a little bit better, but if someone said, oh, this person has neurasthenia, I would like, well, like what? what is that? I don't understand that. There are many of these kind of Asian cultural syndromes. Um, and if, you're, if, if you've heard of these, you, can you might understand them. But um, if you're not from the culture, you don't really kind of understand them. So uh, a couple of them are soyang. Have you heard of this one? It's, uh, uh, and oftentimes, these are uh, epidemic. So if some people decide that, oh, may, they may have a problem with this, then they, um, 
and gets transmitted to other people. So Soyang or Koro is a kind of a classic epidemic. It's males who develop the delusion that their penises are being retracted back into their abdomens. So, and this occurs in an epidemic form. So it's not like um, sporadically, but once one person says this and maybe tells his friends or something like that, that I feel like this is happening, other people may develop this delusion too. And they've tracked like epidemics of this through Guangdong province and Hainan Island. It's kind of interesting. I mentioned neurasthenia. Um, Hikikomori, has anyone ever heard of Hikikomori as a cultural syndrome? Uh, this is a Japanese syndrome. I'll just mention this. This is individuals who are kind of uh, usually male, uh, stay in the house for long periods, um, uh, kind of a, I think in, in uh, psychiatric terms, we might say failure to launch. So these are into, like usually males stay at home, live with their parents into their 30s and 40s. They just hang out, listen to music, play video games. I, every once in a while, that sounds really good to me. Uh, but, um, uh, and there's a, there's a um, uh, um, an industry of individuals, usually uh, spearheaded, the frontline people are usually, I shouldn't say frontline people, but the point people are usually, contact people are women, who, young women who go in and try to coax these people out. And the reason why, like, like for myself, I might, well, if I was an American psychiatrist, speaking, well, maybe that's just like severe social anxiety or something like that, they don't want to come out. But um, it's noticed, it's a common thing in Japan, and people are aware of it. Um, and what are the cultural beliefs that support this? It's very interesting. It may not necessarily be just with the patient, per se, but if you interview the parents of these individuals, like, well, they can't let him go out. We, you know, he needs to stay in the house. And there are stories of you know, parents who move out of the house so that the, the child can stay in there and get bigger. Now, in American culture, that would be intolerable. We're just, you know, we're just talking a little bit about it. our kids come home for a few days and we're like, oh my God, I can't take it. They've got to get out of here. No, only kidding. I love my children. Um, <laughs> And what about Western, other Western cultural syndromes? Um, one, of the, uh, one of the first things that people often talk about is eating disorders, anorexia nervosa. Generally, you don't see eating disorders unless you have a culture that emphasizes thinness, that has the ideal of beauty assistance. You will see anorexia, I mean, people don't want to eat because things, they feel like food is poison or they don't have an appetite. That's not anorexia nervosa. Anorexia nervosa, part of the definition is the person has to believe that they are fat, first of all, and that they are trying to be thinner so that they can look better, okay? So you don't have that disorder unless you have that cultural belief that being thinner is better. And uh, you can track uh, acculturation in, West, in Hong Kong and other Asian cultures where you see the beginning people, women in general, getting eating disorders as they become more acculturated to Western lifestyle. So being thin as being beautiful, you get more likelihood of getting eating disorders in that situation. Uh, I'm, some of these, I just have to say that I'm just meaning to be provocative, but menopause. The only symptoms of menopause that are cross-cultural, I think, are hot flashes at night. The, all the other things like dizziness and stuff like that don't, are not, don't, don't uh, register cross-culturally necessarily. And I put this up as not necessarily these are wholly um, cultural syndromes, but you can understand that like things like uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, certain traumas, and how trauma is interpreted is very culturally important. Personality disorders, what is kind of considered pathological, what's considered normative, what would be um, um, philocultural beliefs and attitudes, okay? Uh, one, even medical conditions can have very strong cultural, that wouldn't be considered a cultural syndrome, but it would be having strong cultural components. I like to, how can diabetes mellitus be cultural? Well, I, when I was in medical school, we were told, look, Pima Indians, they have like a very high rate of uh, insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus. That must mean there's a strong genetic component. That shows that diabetes mellitus is a biological phenomenon. It's a strong genetic component. But what was overlooked and has come out over time is that in the past, it wasn't as if people, Pima Indians had a high rate of diabetes mellitus way back before they met the Western settlers or colonists or became part of American society. What, what uh, fosters and causes, or is a very important part, is the cultural behaviors of eating and what you eat. 
It's like you can't get diabetes mellitus if you ate what the Pima Indians ate 300 years ago. There just wasn't enough food. It's only at the advent of barbecue meat and all this other stuff that we eat, potato chips and stuff like that. that so the cultural aspect of even diabetes mellitus, as you can see, can't be, shouldn't be overlooked. And that, that's my main point about uh, these cultural syndromes is that some of them are really clearly, like cultural beliefs are really important. And addressing those cultural beliefs is a way of dealing with the disorders, by the way. So um, I don't know how many of you know this, but in Italy, for example, runway models, they have to have a BMI of 18 before they can go down the runway. So the idea is we don't want to foster uh, people being too thin as our ideal of beauty and health. That, that's pathological in a way. OK. So now, let, I, I've been going through all this. What's our definition of a mentally healthy? What is a mentally healthy person? How do we, and what is meant by psychologically minded? I mean, you may not hear this as much as I do as a psychiatrist, but in psychiatry, we're all, we want the patient who's psychologically minded. And uh, how do we even think about mental illness in a way? So now, in, in the West, the characteristic of a mentally healthy person is someone who's able to express their feelings in words. We love that as psychiatrists and psychotherapists. We want people to express their feelings in words, right? Use your words. But that, as I just discussed, the primacy of the word is very culturally sanctioned and highlighted. Um, we have a high value on insight and understanding one's emotions. Uh, we are, want the person to be individuated. Path pathology means if you say someone's really enmeshed with their family, that's a pathological condition. Uh, and then the ability to trust the clinician is thought to be a sign of a mentally healthy person. Someone who's suspicious and doesn't want to talk to you is kind of not thought. But I, again, I want to recommend all these things are very Western. Right? These things, as I mentioned earlier, may not are, are culturally influenced. And th this is an example of just thinking, this is a, a, a thing that we actually value. And there isn't a universal, like, oh, just because you um, uh, express feelings and words, that means you're actually mentally healthier. That's actually better. Okay. And so I just wanted to highlight in this situation the importance of the patient's perspective. And so the main, and this is a very important thing, is when you work with people, you want to ask them, what do you think caused this problem? Or do you think this is a problem? This is a picture of my niece with this uh, cotton candy. I said, is this too much cotton candy for you? And she said, no, not at all. So uh, I don't know. If that, but that, that's a sense of like, you want to know what, what the other person's perspective is. So. OK. And so just the bottom line is you shouldn't overlook um, cultural components of psychiatric diagnoses or other medical diagnoses as well. And nor should you, I'm not saying you should overlook biological components either, obviously, or psychological components. But we want to make sure we, we take into account cultural components. OK. Uh, now, uh, talking about broader cultural stressors and supports. And I, I divide this up into, just as an example, there are a few US cultural trends that I just want to mention to you. And then a focus on Asian families and cultural conflicts amongst Asian families. And so here are just some examples that I'll go through really quickly of cultural or political phenomenon that have affected mental health care delivery in the United States. And I consider these social or cultural phenomenon. Um, and examples, these are examples, secularization or psychologization. So in the past, you know, uh, alcoholism was a moral issue or a religious or spiritual problem. With the advent of Freud and the understanding of psychology, it's really the development of like how unconscious, unconscious conflicts have become like mainstream in our culture now. So that's been a very important part of um, uh, our culture and how we think about things. Kind of our same as our definition of mental health. I have a little Wikipedia. Uh, link here if you're interested in reading more about what is meant by secularization and how that affects us. Uh, eugenics, this is not current now, but in the past, we in the United States, you, the eugenics movement was very strong and, made, and inspired some the Nazis, for example. More recently, through the 60s and 70s, there were several key trends. Uh, so the idea of like we were trying to promote mental health, that's what we call mental health, as opposed to mental disorders. The advent of antipsychotics allowed many individuals with previously diagnosed schizophrenia and other chronic mental illnesses to have far less symptoms and be able to live independently. And with that, the federal government intervened in public health and decreased the number of state hospitals across the United States. Uh, that coincided with the civil rights movements, with the idea that people should not be incarcerated and should be uh, live in the least drastic environment as possible. Now, the 
su there were subsequent problems with the community mental health, uh, 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 community mental health delivery systems in that money was saved by closing down the state hospitals, but they was not reintroduced into the community to support individuals once they left the state hospital. And we still see this now that there are increasing rates of criminal incarceration of the mentally ill. Many people who have uh, severe and chronic mental illness are now in jail as opposed to in, in, in hospitals, or, or, or they're homeless, uh, for example. Now, uh, more recently with the DSM, Three, the DSMs, the modern DSMs. Uh, Kraepelin was a psychiatrist who's uh, very well regard, well known. He described, said, we should really describe these illnesses and base our diagnoses based on what we see and what we can describe. And so that was uh, the DSM, and called the neo Kraepelinian movement. And then we have a proliferation in, throughout the 80s of psychotropic medications with documented efficacy. So for those of you who don't remember, Prozac or fluoxetine came out in 1980, I believe. Um, we have the establishment of genetic bases for many of the major disorders. They're probably very complicated, multigenetic, uh, polygenetic uh, interactions with the environment, but we believe that this is true for many of our major disorders, like bipolar disorder or schizophrenia. And now we have a lot of advanced uh, brain imaging technology that we're just still kind of getting the hang of and seeing all the cool things we can do with and understanding mental illness. And then finally, there's increasing awareness that mental illness is a major contributor to worldwide illness uh, burden and disability. Uh, the three leading causes of dailies, which is disability in the world, is HIV AIDS, depression, and ischemic heart disease. So depressive disorders ranks very high globally. Uh, it's in the top five here in the West. So those are just examples of cultural, social phenomenon that impact health care, mental health care delivery, and people um, seeking care. So now let me talk a little bit about Asian families um, and cultural conflicts that we should think about. Uh, so most of you uh, may be familiar with Confucianism. Uh, so I, this, I apologize if this is a, a rerun for you, and your parents have told you this multiple times. But uh, Wulun is the five relationships, right? Did we all learn about the five relationships? So the, in Confucianism, the key uh, relationships are there, and there are five. That's the relationship with you and uh, the parent, the relationship between the individual and friends, the individual uh, with siblings, uh, the individual with state, and, I'm, and the spouse. I think those are the those are the those are the five major relationships that people have. Family is the basic unit of function in in the Confucian ethic, and everything kind of mirrors the family. So the emperor, he's supposed to be the father of the the, the whole empire. That's the family. So the, the 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 basic unit of construction and everything that's mirrored on this is the family. The golden rule is meant to be. Uh, thought of as uh, do unto others what you would have do un unto you, uh, and kind of the golden is the golden rule or the golden mean, um, and virtue is having to do with doing uh, being good to other people and working to strive for um, the benefit of everyone in the family. Um, and what else did I want to say? And just harmony is so important. Uh, face. You've all sort of losing face or gaining face. And I actually think in Chinese, it's you, you don't give someone's face. You, you, present, you, present your, you, pre, you, give the other, you present a good face to the other person. That means to respect them. Data hen yo mian. Right? OK. So and in the traditional Chinese family, these Confucian roles, Confucianism actually laid out what the responsibilities were in all those five relationships really clearly, what each person was supposed to do in that relationship and the expectations, right? Um, and that there should be harmony and interdependence. It was a patriarchal situation where the father was the main person. And there's extended family structure. So this is kind of the ideal of the traditional Chinese family. Everyone lives together, multi-generational. Uh, there's different expectations for sons and daughters, right? Sons are meant to go out in the world. Daughters are married or given, married slash given to other families. So the sons kind of carry on your name. The parent-child relationship is the primary relationship. Um, very important to, to um, uh, uh, obey your parents, respect them. Hierarchy is really cherished, right? So you, the, when you're working with the emperor, you don't question him or criticize him. You have to do what they say. And then I, I mentioned loss of face already. 
How does that compare with uh, contemporary Chinese American families? Now, in Chinese American families, uh, we often have a nuclear family, right? Because we move around the country a lot and stuff like that. Is a biarchal structure, meaning that the spousal dyad, in, ter in reality, in some ways, is the primary relationship in the family, less than the children uh, and the parent. But the, the 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 spousal dyad is important. Sons and daughters are both expected to leave the home, uh, and they all interact with the outside world. So you might begin to see how. Conflicts can occur when you go from one place to another place. Uh, Chinese child rearing practices. Uh, in some sense, in Chinese, I know dependence is fostered more. Physical exploration is discouraged. When I went out with my uh, baby, if they were, when it was very, I got scolded by so many Chinese uh, mo uh, older moms, women out there saying, the baby's too small. You got to leave her at home. This is, this is not good. Um, Love is expressed to your children by providing for them, cooking for them. Um, and there's an expectation that later on, your children will provide for the adults. I, I think I tried to inculcate my parents, my own kids with this. I'm not sure. Uh, I've been good luck. I, I, I don't know how many of you have heard of this, but like you're supposed to chew your food for your elderly parents who don't have teeth. That's the, that's the uh, uh, ultimate in um, uh, uh, kind of filial piety. So. Whenever I get mad at my daughter, it's like, I'm, I'm not going to chew your food, Dad, if you, <laughs> if, you know, if you keep doing that. And so, but, you know, we prize compliance, self-restraint, and obedience in our children. I shouldn't say we, but that's a traditional. Humility is encouraged. Praise of others is used as a met method to admonish your children. Uh, and the body with its hair and skin is received from parents. Do not cause it harm. I don't know what that is in Chinese, but that's the phrase I've heard. So for me, when I'm talking with um, uh, uh, Asian families or even non-Asian families, if I'm thinking about culture, I try to ask about what are the kind of the family supports and stress that you have? How did you get to this country? That's really important. What were you thinking? What, what did you think life was going to be like when you came to the United States? And what has it turned out? Has it panned out? What has it been actually like? And then finally, how do you... How do you think about raising your kids? What are you doing with your, if they have kids or, or if they were raised here? How were you raised? What happened? I find all these like kind of really, uh, from a psychiatrist point of view, very meaningful and juicy uh, pieces of information. So uh, let me talk a little bit about cultural elements of the relationship with the clinicians. And I'm going to, I'm running a little bit down on time, so I'm going to make it as fast as I can, actually. So one is a relationship to authority. So again, when, when I mentioned before that in our cul in Western culture, there's more like, there's more of a peer egalitarian. And in uh, Asian cultures, there's more comfort with a hierarchical society. Now, on the other hand, um, how many of you have heard of Milgram's experiment? Milgram's experiment? That was actually meant as a cultural experiment. So the idea was that um, uh, instructors told individuals to shock another person who was supposed to be the subject, but it was actually an actor. And it turns out these individuals who were told, the idea was, we're going to do this experiment in America, and we're going to show that um, Americans will resist authority, and they won't shock this other person to death. And then we'll go and do this in Germany. Um, and then show that how the Germans, that's, how, that's what led to uh, World War, you know, the Holocaust and World War II. They never left New Haven. They, didn't, they, couldn't, get the pay, they couldn't get the subjects to not obey the, um, the authority figure. So even in America, even in the US, a strong, now this is one of the most important, um, uh, this has been rated as one of the most important experiments in the history of psychology because once you know this experiment, it really makes you think about are you going to automatically obey authority? So I think it's a really important one to know about. Uh, I, there's actually a YouTube clip about it, and given the time, I'm not going to show it, but there's a link here for those of you who are interested. It starts with, uh, has some really interesting old footage of Stanley Milgram and interviewing him and, and uh, actually showing some clips of the experiment itself. So highly recommend you get a, if you get a chance to take a look at the Stanley Milgram experiment on YouTube. I talked about informed consent actually earlier, but this is a consent form, the issues of it's written, what does it mean for the patient to sign it, and then also like what are the other kinds of cultural considerations of what does it mean if you know the patient signs this for you, are they just going to obey you and not, a, if we really need to make sure that they understand what um, a consent form means. Um, 
not too many people are here in mental health, but given what I mentioned about mental health, mental health earlier, uh, some of the issues around some of the theories, particularly around psychoanalysis and psychodynamic theory, have to do with this definition of mental health, which is so culturally bound. So in the West, we have this definition of the self, meaning myself, internal, um, the mind-body split with Descartes, Rene Descartes talked about, and there's a separation of the mind and the body. The Western conception of self is different from the non-Western conception of self, meaning that in the non-Western conception of self, oftentimes what really matters is our relationship to others. The relationships, the five primary relationships, are really uh, paramount. Um, I'm going to skip through the, 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 the characteristics of a mentally healthy person that I went through. Uh, the concept of transference, which is the psychological idea of like, well, when patients, transference means this patient comes to you and they have these kind of ideas of what you are as an authority figure and they behave to you as this, this um, uh, transferential relationship, but there's a real relationship underneath it. That's between the meeting between two people. That's the real relationship. But in other cultures, the real relationship is that relationship between the doctor and the patient. The relationship between Descartes and Joe is not important. What really matters is the my role and their roles. So with you, the brother or sister, parent, that's what matters. There isn't like a, that's not the prime, the primary relationship is not the one that's underneath, the real relationship, as it were. The unconscious has to do with these uh, uh, feelings that we're unaware of and so forth and that they come into conflict with each other. Uh, ego functions and ego strength, again, I'm sorry, this is a little bit um, uh, jargony, but ego functions regards like uh, we prize people who can think linearly in a kind of a focused manner, many Asian cultures also, but just to be aware, that's a cultural prize. People who think in like out of the box kind of things, that may not be as prized in other cultures. That, that is more prized in other cultures. Objects refers to um, uh, uh, parental figures in psychology and how you deal with objects and what does it mean to be an object. Again, more psychology. If you're interested in more detail, there's an excellent book written by, uh, called Cultural Psychotherapy, Working with Culture in the Clinical Environment by Karen Seeley. Um, you're getting the idea, maybe, the false self. I don't know how many of you have heard of this concept, the false self. Winnicott described kids who, uh, adults who, when they were kids, had to present this false self and kind of be obedient and compliant. But really underneath, they were not, they, they felt they were stunted and so forth. Now, in uh, other cultures, that might be, that's good. The person should feel humble. And uh, uh, shame is a sign of someone who's been parented correctly. Right, someone who doesn't have any shame or doesn't have any face. That's something that's not right. Uh, Heinz Kohut, uh, his theories of narcissism, he even described his theories of narcissism as being very culturally bound. I just want to summarize a little bit about what we discussed so far this evening, and thank you all for hanging in there with me. Um, this is the outline of our talk. We talked about cultural identity, what it means to be uh, individualistic or collectivistic, how that influences how we look at the world, how we look at ourselves, um, uh, whether a cult how much acculturation matters in this kind of situation, and how much it helps uh, with understanding our patients, understanding other people. Explanatory models. How do people understand what is, um, what causes these illnesses? Uh, cultural syndromes we discussed, the importance of culture and understanding uh, pieces of the person's uh, um, uh, experience and that the context in which whatever illness is or anything that happens to them really matters. It's not just we can look at these things in isolation. Cultural stressors and supports. And I talked about, uh, you know, these kind of U.S. trends that have changed mental health care and mental health care delivery, as well as the transition from a more Confucian, from a traditional Confucian society immigrating to the United States where we have a more, you know, nuclear family, individualistic, and how that can affect uh, families. And then uh, the doctor-patient relationship, how that affects how patients, how they think about their relationship to authority and things like informed consent, how that matters. Um, and thank you. That was just really nice of you to be here this evening. <laughs>